Hello. I would like to thank you all for coming to Media Macro with our alumna, Nancy Miller, hosted by SCAD Savannah's Student Media Department. Student Media is a powerful network of student editors, writers, and visual storytellers who share their work with the SCAD community and beyond. I'm Kat Medina, and I have the privilege of working directly with these students as the director of student media for all our SCAD campuses. I also have the unique privilege today of introducing our presenter, Nancy Miller. Nancy Miller received both her BFA and MFA in illustration from SCAD and is an esteemed educator and artist. Having shared her creative talents with dozens of publications and hundreds of students, Miller has a unique hands-on approach to her work. Creating at the intersection of two passions, students and art, Miller has found her voice as a children's book author and illustrator. With a unique style of cut paper sets, she creates tiny worlds that quite literally pop off the page. Miller continues to bring her creations to life in her first book as both the author and illustrator, Sun, Moon, and Star, a retelling of a Korean folktale. Sun, Moon, and Star has been acquired for publishing by Huntington House for release in early 2026. Outside her publications, Miller continues to inspire as a member of the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators and a host for the weekly podcast, My Creative Life. Please join me in welcoming Nancy Miller. All right. Thank you guys so much for being here on a Saturday at almost one. I'm just, it, it really warms my heart to have this warm welcome. Um, as she said, my name is Nancy So Miller. I am a children's book author, illustrator, and art teacher. So I um, am new to being a picture book author, um, but the love of stories started over 13 years ago when I became an art teacher. And I hope this will go forward. There we go. So that's me with some of my students. So I realized the power of good storytelling because as an art teacher, I had an antsy group of kindergarten students who did not want to listen, which is normal for little people at that age. And I offered to read them a children's book story. They immediately quieted down and got so excited. So I felt like I'd waved a magic wand over the students with that good storytelling. So 10 years after that fact, I decided to go to SCAD and get my MFA in illustration. And with that, I remembered how much I loved picture books and that storytelling and the magic of it all. So I decided I would take a book illustration class. So I actually took Professor Brian Bose's Illustrating for Trending Books in 2021. And in that class, we had to pitch what we were doing for our illustration project. And I had a friend of mine who was an author. They lent me their manuscript and they said, you can illustrate it. Brian looked at me and kind of said, have you ever thought about writing your own stories? And it planted a seed in my head that I could be the author of my own picture book stories. So with that, I decided for my thesis, I would write and illustrate a picture book story. So this is it here in its second reiteration, massive overhaul. It was a complete failure. I have to say, I learned so much from that failure. Um, I made every possible mistake that a newbie author of a picture book could ever make. I had forced rhyme in it. There was no conflict. The kids had no agency. The characters were absolutely boring. So in that experience though, I kind of like realized looking back, okay, I know all the mistakes that you shouldn't make, but I also realized that I enjoyed writing picture books. I love the freedom that I had because I no longer had to wait for an author to write something. I could just say, I'm going to do the entire book myself. So I don't know if that's a little bit egomaniac or something, but I just really love that whole creative control that I had over my writing and illustrating. So with that, I said, you know what, I'm not going to give up. I want to get better at writing. And so I began to think about where could I find inspiration for my own stories? 
that are personal to me. I started looking at moments in my childhood. I started thinking about myself as a parent. I also started thinking about myself as a teacher. One of my students who I absolutely adore, who's in kindergarten, Isaac came up to me and said, I want to be an adult right now. And I said, what, Isaac, you want to be an adult? Why, it's so stressful. He says, I want to decide when I go to bed and I want to decide when I go to sleep. And the realization came to me that as small children, they have absolutely no autonomy. Adults are constantly telling them where they're going to be, what they're going to do, and how they're going to do it. And so I started thinking back with that conversation with Isaac and saying to myself, when was a point where I lacked autonomy, where that it created conflict in my own life? And so the top, that first picture is me when I was four years old living in South Korea. Nobody asked me if I wanted to move to a new country, learn a new language, learn a new culture, and would leave the only family I had ever known. So that created a lot of conflict in my own life. Once I immigrated to the US, I look back and I think as an adult, who was that one person who offered me some connection of family? And that was my grandmother. She would make these phone calls. This was before Zoom, a long time ago. And international calls were very expensive and she always made time for me. And that resonated with me. And I began to think as an author, what if, these what ifs came to mind and I began to think, what if my grandmother had come from South Korea to visit me in the US? What if my grandmother and I both love to do the same things? And what if she wanted to pass some of the Korean culture that I missed out of growing here in the US? So that story ended up becoming um, the story sewn together that is currently out on submission with my agent. So I did a full manuscript and then I actually did a book dummy that my agent is pitching to different editors. And then you go figure, another story happens. <laughs> so the second one to the right, Sun, Moon and Star, uh, was the story that at the time, the agent that I had, I had started pitching some story ideas. And this one came to mind 15 years ago, I read a Korean folk tale that I, really connected with. Uh, it had three sisters who were escaping a tiger and I am one of three sisters. And I thought, how can I re-image the story to make it fit me? You know, once again, a little bit of the ego saying, you know, I'm gonna put myself in a children's book, why not? And so I really enjoyed that process of personalizing the story and saying, you know, how can I make it fit kind of this contemporary world that we live in and still bring in some of that Korean folk telling into it. So I went ahead and I finished that story. At, unfortunately, at the same time, once I was about ready to go out on submission, uh, my agent and I parted ways. But as luck would have it, another door opens and I got a wonderful call from a librarian who said, I would love for you to come share one of your picture book stories. And I was like, really? I was so flattered and honored that they would want me to come visit their school. So Ebenezer Elementary School in Effingham County, the librarian Salem Seconder um, had me do a school visit. I read Sun, Moon, and Star to over 400 elementary students, and it was a delight. What I found out by reading the story and sharing it with the kids is that it read really well. So what I mean by reading really well is that I could get a kindergartner to sit the entire time and listen attentively, and I can also get a fifth grader interested in the story and ask questions that were very insightful at the end of it. After the presentation, I had some students that always like to linger and you can kind of tell that they like art too, they're art kids. So they come up and they're like admiring my artwork. And this one little girl in particular, she looks at my artwork and she is like, this is so cool. I just want to take it home and play with it. And I just looked at her and said, me too, <laughs> I love it too. And so that connection of seeing, even though I didn't have my agent anymore and seeing that my work had value to the very audience that I want them reading and enjoying my stories, um, that was really important. 
another aspect about it reading well is that myself as the reader reading it over and over again to the new group of students, I found that I really enjoyed the performance aspect of it. Like I got to play each of the roles because it's a little bit like um, Little Red Riding Hood in that aspect. And a lot of author illustrators have reimagined Little Red Riding Hood. But I love that I could play out the parts and then I could even interact with the students. And so it made it a better story and that it could possibly get acquired. So it did get acquired by Holiday House. And I wanted to talk about, oh, here is a, oh, forget the slide. Oh, here's me presenting to some of the elementary students. And I highly recommend if you write and illustrate your own picture book and maybe it hasn't gotten acquired yet, go to the very kids that you want to hear and read your stories to because they will do such a great job of giving you feedback. There are future little editors and art directors in there and they're very honest and they will tell you exactly. And you can go back and do those changes before you ever send it out. So highly well worth it. And plus they treat you like a rock star. I felt like at the end of the day that I was like, I don't know, like Tommy DePaula or Eric Carl. It was fantastic. I went a little bit too far, but before I get to this slide, I did wanna talk a little bit more about how that story got acquired, um, Sun, Moon and Star. So because I lost my agent, I had to go back into the query trenches, which is not fun. Um, so it's when you're actually sending out your work to different literary agents to see if they wanna sell it. And then at the same time, I came across the list of a hundred different publisher, an author, Bitsy Kempler, she put this together and they accept unsolicited submissions. So that means that these are publishers that do not require you to have an agent to buy your, to actually see your work and purchase it. So Holiday House was one of those publishers. I had four book dummies by that point and I started seeing who could fit the best on this list for that particular story. And then I started sending them out by email. So two weeks later, I got a call from a wonderful editor at Holiday House in New York City. And she said, I love your story. I would love to meet with you um, virtually. And so we set up an a uh, virtual meeting. She gave me great feedback about the story. And she said, take a month, go ahead and work on it and then send it back to me. So I went ahead and reworked it and I really thought it out. I went to the library and then I checked out like 50 different children's books that were folk tales and fairy tales, not because I wanna copy them, but because I wanna understand their story structure. I wanna understand the point of view and tense that the author has chosen to take the reader on. And then I really put it to heart in my own manuscript and then I emailed it back to her she thanked me for my time, said she liked the changes and that she would share it with the other editors. I didn't know that it meant that she was taking it to acquisition. So then about three weeks later, I get um, the magical email that every author illustrator imagines getting and she offered um, on my book. And so it got acquired. It was a magical moment. I thought I was about ready to die and fall over. Now I have to actually make this whole entire book. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, um, but I was extremely honored because Holiday House, um, they do such a great job with their author and illustrator um, works. They've worked with some amazing um, illustrators that have won amazing awards. And so I know my story is at a good place and it's gonna get there to be at the level that I'm gonna be proud of to go ahead and share that with students at school visits. So here we're now at this meme and I wanted to share with you that I have felt like every different moment of these images as uh, you know, I write and illustrate picture books and there of course is Tommy DePaula with whom I actually adore his writing. Um, and then I did feel like a rock star as I visit the schools. My editor, who's so kind, um, a lot of times I do feel like, ooh, I didn't know that. I feel like I'm five. And then probably what society thinks that those of us who write and illustrate picture books do, um, who I would love to aspire to be, Beck Haina, who is a, an accomplished children's book author and illustrator in South Korea, absolutely adore her work. 
And then what I actually do, I think it took me 28 manuscript versions of the book that got acquired by Holiday House. And then it took me over 10 book dummies. And so at points of the journey, I felt very overwhelmed. But I think with the skill sets you build up on, you realize you can accomplish whatever you really set your focus to. And so some of the key things that I took away from it was, you know, be willing to do the work. If you really feel like you can do the work, even though at times you're being asked like that first set of revisions, you know, I'm not getting paid for any of it. There's nobody guaranteeing me a book contract at the end of the day, but I just really wanted to see it be a better story. So doing the work and then also having some patience, the, it, Children's book publishing tends to be on the slow side if you're new and starting out. Of course, those people who have the fancy nice silver stickers, I think, and the gold stickers, that goes a little bit quicker for them. But if you're debuting, it may take you, like in my case, from the day I wrote my manuscript to um, when it will actually be in my hands, it'll be over three and a half years. And so it's a long haul to get there. Um, also be willing to work on your skill set. So I kept taking classes on writing because I knew I felt like I was weaker at that after graduate school. And that really helped. And then a little bit of luck. I know a lot of people don't like to talk about it, but you never know who's watching or looking. And, you know, sometimes good things happen when you put your work out and you put yourself out there. And I know that that is counterintuitive to a lot of us. We like to be in our little nest, working away on our stories and our pictures. Um, but at the end of the day, you really want those young readers to get those stories in their hands. And, it, and for me, it was like getting readers and having young people who never saw themselves in a book start to feel like they mattered and that they counted in the world of children's book publishing. So with that said, don't be so caught up in what is on the bookshelves today and don't be so worried about what you see trending on book talk. Um, write what you're passionate about. What do you love at the end of the day? Because it's such a long haul that you're gonna be spending on this um, that you're gonna be able to see it through and keep iterating that story to the end. And so I know that um, you guys can get there by doing, uh, doing the work and I wish you all the best of luck. And since you guys were kind enough to listen attentively, I do have some resources and you don't have to take any pictures of this. I have a QR code at the very end of this where you can just snap the QR code and you can get a free PDF and download all this stuff here. So writing process for me, I read a lot of picture books. So it's just been very helpful. Like before, because I'm an illustrator, I was just looking at the pictures, to be honest. I wasn't really reading the words. And now I'm just like, oh, I know these names of these authors. I've gotten to interact with them and understanding how they process the story. And I tried multiple ways of doing the storytelling. Like I have friends who will actually just draw the pictures and then write the words after. I'm different, I'm kind of like, I have to have a manuscript so I can have like a road to follow along. And then there's some people who are hybrid, they get a little bit writing done and then they start doing the actual thumbnailing and coming up with the images. Analyze a lot of picture books. So I got so obsessed, I would just like start typing out the words. So I would literally type out the words without the images and how does that stand on its own? They're two different mediums, the writing and the images, but they do have to stand separately and independently of each other. Um, the two complement each other like a really good marriage. Thinking about how you're creating emotion in your stories, I asked my second graders flat out, I said, we were doing storyboarding in comics um, in second and third grade. And I said, what makes a good story, kids? And they said, number one, interesting characters. Number two, there's a problem. Number three, how did it make me feel after I read that? And I was like, whoa, I have nothing to teach you all. You should be like graduate level storytellers. So what it delighted me is like never once did they say it has to be beautifully, highly rendered illustrations. It's really about the story at what you're trying to tell that reader. And when I read a lot of picture books, I'm looking at how is now the illustrator, how are they playing their role for the pacing and the page turns? How are they getting me excited to go to the next part of the story? 
get a critique group. Right now, here's an amazing opportunity. You know everybody in this room is probably fairly obsessed because they're here on a Saturday listening to somebody talk about their debut um, acquired picture book. So you could possibly find some really good critique partners. Um, these people have, my critique partners have helped me along this journey. It definitely was not something I did all on my own. I am so not like that. So I needed help from other stronger writers and they gave me outstanding advice. Um, beta readers, so when I say a beta reader, that's somebody who is not as higher level as a editor or critique partner. This is just somebody who's reading your story and giving you feedback maybe on grammar and just maybe just if they liked it or not. And that could be once again, you know, beta test it with some children. Be prepared for lots of drafts and whether it's your book dummy because you tend to do more of the uh, drawing side of it or maybe the writing side of it. The sewn together one, I know on my 50th the draft of that, and it actually, you know, it was such a bummer because I go like, if I'd been at my 50, this editor told me she took it to acquisitions, but it failed there. If maybe I'd had the 50th version, it might have passed acquisitions. It might have made it to the home run, but you just never know. It's like, just be willing to evolve your story. Okay, so these are the additional resources if you have not um, joined the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrate, I do not get a kickback at all from any of these things that I'm mentioning today. I joined as a student, as a graduate student. They have a student membership. It's highly affordable. You get so much help in the kid lick community. People are at different points of their careers. Some are so established, winning some of the top awards in children's book um, literature and you can get to connect with them. Also, they set up conferences where you can meet editors, art directors, and agents to get your work out there. Um, that is actually, those of you, anybody had Professor Brian Bowes? Anybody? Oh, that's him. Let's go, Brian, he's tiny. I should've gotten a close up of him. Um, but he did a um, special workshop for the local people here in Savannah. I am the local Savannah representative for the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. So we have local free events. If you decide you're like, it's not in my budget, you can come for free. Find a mentor. I got so lucky. So I mentored with R. Gregory Christie. He has illustrated almost 70 children's books. He's won almost every award under the sun from a Caldecott honor to numerous Coretta Scott King awards, a Sibbert award for nonfiction for one of the books that he illustrated. I went to one of his workshops at the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. He said, you know what? Anybody who wants to email me, go ahead. And you know what? I got brave. I said an email and I said, do you ever take interns? I really loved your workshop. And he said, yes, I do. And so I did 25 weeks with him. And probably one of the best things I learned was not only the craft of illustrating and telling a good story visually, but the business side of the children's book publishing industry, which is very unique on its own. So having somebody who's been in there for over 30 plus years, it's, it's well worth um, finding internships with other illustrators. Okay, so these were some of the picture book writing programs. Like I, uh, once again, don't get a kid, but Storytellers Academy, I did that one. They have some really good writing courses online, self-paced. Ari Chung, who did Mix, he's the one who started Storytellers Academy. Um, his picture book writing process really speaks to me, like how he does his back and forth was great. They also have, if you're interested in writing for middle grade, YA, graphic novels, they have other people who are specifically addressing the writing portion of it. And how should you have a pitch and a query to an agent or to an editor? Um, I met somebody else who did the Children's Book Academy. They had good things to say about it. Their book was acquired by a big five publisher. Her name is Cherry Mo. Uh, yeah, they said that was great. I know that Gigi Morales is one of the instructors for that. So top-notch instructors, 12 by 12. I had a fellow Southern Breeze, which is the Georgia area Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, Julie Kuhn. Um, she did 12 by 12. She's an author illustrator. She started out as a uh, elementary school counselor and then started doing that. And she's on her third um, 
children's book deal. These are resources that I use all the time when writing my picture books. Um, this is the first one by Ann Whitford Paul. It's kind of like everybody's like Bible in children's book, uh, picture book writing. So writing picture books is a great one. I love that she talks about different ways of writing the story and she goes over all of those POVs. She'll take the same story and then just reiterate it, reiterate it. So that was really helpful for me because I need concrete examples. And then she recommended the children's writer's word book because if you're writing for younger ages, one of the things that I've noticed, people tend to write like vocabulary because we're adults, so we're talking at a higher vocabulary level. This breaks it down by age range. So the words that most kindergartners would know or first grade, second, up to fifth grade was great. Uh, the emotions, the SARS. So as my second grade student pointed out, it's about how you felt after you read the story. How do you show that? in words instead of telling, because that's always a big thing they talk about in writing, D show me, don't tell me how somebody feels. And so that has some great examples for that. As I said, um, SCBWI, if you join, this is where I got my list. It's called the book. It's also digital, but you can basically, they update it every year. You will get a list of your uh, literary agents that specialize in the children's book market. You will also get all the wonderful editors and art directors and their names and where the publishing houses are listed. Also what they acquire, what they like to read. And then this is the link for the 100 publishers accepting unsolicited submissions that I used, that was great. Um, I like YouTube, like most of us, I think they're hilarious. Um, Bookends Literary has a YouTube channel. That's Jessica Faust and James McGowan. Jessica Faust is actually the owner of Bookends Literary. Uh, James McGowan is one of the literary agents that specializes in the children's book market. And so he's like in the top like 10 for sales in the US picture book market. And it's just fascinating to listen to their side of why do they pick something? What makes them go, oh, I got to acquire this? Or, I mean, they've got to sign this particular client, client, so then that book could get acquired. So they're just really funny to listen to. Oh, I didn't mean to start that because that's if you want it in the resources. Oh, manuscript wish list. So editors and agents, um, they will post specifically what they like to read. Just like myself or you guys out there, there's certain things you just don't like to read. Like, I don't hate me, but I can't read science fiction. I, I just start glazing over and I fall asleep. But these um, agents and editors will list, hey, this is what I'm looking for. This is how you can reach me. Um, and just, um, yeah, just basic things of how you can even submit to them. Query tracker. So nowadays, when you're in the query trenches, they're talking about using query tracker for a lot of your literary agents. So this platform, it's free to use. The literary agents will use this to track all the submissions. So this is the thing, like one literary agent that I listened to, they said when they were open for submissions, they got 800 in one weekend. So this is how they manage it. And then you can set up an account and then you can start like, sending your work to them when they're open. And it's also good for you as a writer to be able to keep track of things. Um, the other thing is just a free little spreadsheet. I set up a little spreadsheet because I like to keep track outside of Query Tracker of who I've sent to, when I've sent it, did they have a reply? Uh, my good friend, Carolyn B. Frazier, she's a nonfiction children's book writer. She has her website and you can get a newsletter and she does a lot of like, when are they having certain pitch events? Those are all free. You don't have to pay for them. You just put your little pitch on there. You can put your illustrations from your samples and um, potentially an editor or art director or agent can like it and then you can send to them. This is my podcast, uh, Informational Interviews. I highly recommend it, especially if you're a student. And Brian was really great about reaching out into the community of um, publishing and talking to people who are the ones making the books. And so I started like interviewing a lot of authors and illustrators. 
and I had such a great time. So if you ever get bored and need to listen to something while you're working, I got over 200 interviews now. Um, they lean heavily towards more children's book illustration and authors. We need diverse books. I highly recommend this is another option that you can get a free mentorship with some of the top authors and illustrators in children's book publishing. Um, you apply, it's scholarship, and they look at merit and different things like that, and then they'll work with you across the year. Um, I met another SCAD grad, and he did this, and he said it was phenomenal. Oh, this is my online. If you would like to connect, uh, my website, Instagram, and uh, our sadly Twitter is now X, uh, but I'm still on there. Um, these were the links, but here's the QR code for the presentation. Feel free to click on that. And then there's like, it's a secret doorway on my website. And so you can just download the PDF. There is also the spreadsheet for, for tracking your queries. You can download that as well. But thank you so much for listening. I apologize, that's a lot of information to throw at you all, but I hope that you are successful on your journey and the passion that you're showing today just by being here um, shows me that you will have most likely some great success, a lot of future books out there. So thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. I think we have just a minute or two for a couple questions. So myself and my assistant are gonna come around with any of that. If you have a specific question for Nancy, go ahead and raise your hand. Oh, that's a good question. Okay, so like when I got the contract from Holiday House and at that point I did get a new agent, thank goodness. I love my new agent, she's phenomenal. Caitlin Sanchez at Bradford Literary Agency. So what happens is like the one nice thing, you don't have to have an agent. Some people will be very hard lined about what happens is if you have somebody who's an agent, they have somebody in contracts, they will read over all of that because a picture book contract tends to be kind of long. You feel like I've just signed a mortgage or something. Um, but basically you own, if it is a traditional publisher, you want to keep those rights. What I found out is that subsidiary rights, those are the rights that you often hear people say, oh, they turned this book into a Netflix show or this and that and the other. You want to keep that so then you can sell it out to other people. They're basically renting your work. So in the contract, my contract with Holiday House, they say um, if it stops um, selling a certain number of books, then the rights revert back to me. A lot of times, and it's always good to talk to somebody who's more contract knowledgeable because I've, I'm a little bit limited with that. But what I found is like it is really in your best interest to keep your rights. The book publisher will copyright the book for that particular you know, medium. But then like as far as in the case with Holiday House, I did give them world rights. So if they want to go and say, like go to Bologna Book Fair and talk to some of these other publishers that have you know, houses in like Korea or something like that, which that would be a dream, have a book in Korean, uh, they could sell it but then I get something back. Like I always keep that. And then it goes into my royalty checks that come like hopefully twice a year, <laughs> you know? Does that help? Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, well, you know, I doubled down. I think it was taking that advanced um, techniques class in graduate school. Like I started, they always have you do those mood boards, you know, they gotta love the sketch professor. They're like, oh, do the mood board. And then it was like, oh, I kept gravitating towards certain things. And for me, I started realizing, I spent a year doing digital illustration. No offense to the people who do all digital, you know, that's amazing that you can do that. I just got so burned out on the computer. I realized, I think it's all the years of doing elementary art. I was like, I do a little weaving, I do painting, I do ceramics with the kids. And then I finally was just like, you know what? I'm just gonna be me and I'm just gonna put it into my artwork. The more I put me into it, the better the reaction I got from editors. So the funny thing is, you know, it's a, it's a gamble. You you do at the end of the day whatever I think for children's books. If because it's so such a long process, I would do what you truly love. If digital is what you love doing, then do the digital. If it's traditional, then do traditional. Just figure out how you can deliver it to the client digitally. 
Um, but at the end of the day, what is going to read uniquely you? Because there are other illustrators who I got inspired for, from that I showed you that do three-dimensional cut paper illustration. There's only a few of us, but I wanted it to be different than everybody else. I wanted it to be like, if you looked at it, you go like, that's my work. And that's really my heart on a plate at the end of the day. If I have to spend three and a half years waiting to get something physical in my hands, I better love it. And so that's what I decided for myself. And so once I gone down that path and I just like, I love this, I love this, I could do this all day long. And then I knew that was the sticking point for me. And then I just kept going deeper. So it's figuring out for you personally, like what fits the best for you and everybody's circumstances and what their interests are is so varied. So I think it's almost a little bit of like soul searching, going out to the desert, maybe meditating. I don't know, but it's just like one of those things that's like, it comes to you and then you realize, and that's why they always push those professors. You gotta love them. They're like, you gotta try lots of things. It's because once you do lots of things, you basically know what you don't like. <laughs> and you go like, oh, I didn't like that. I didn't like that. And so that's why they keep telling you, just try that, try that. And it's and they're, they're kind of a little vague with the answers. <laughs> but um, I hope that helped. Well, they do hire, I mean, there are illustrators. I have friends who are just illustrators only. What I found, and I'm going to be honest, because of what I do, editors were like, we love your work. This is so unique. But then like, nobody wants to take a risk. They're like, oh, this looks a little labor intensive. How long does it take her to make a piece of art, whole entire book? And so it was a risk that I was willing to take. I said, you know what, for me, I'm willing to do that. But there's plenty of my friends they just illustrate books. They just send out like that book that I showed you from the SCBWI. You send out your emails, you send out your postcard. I sent out over 2000. I just lost count and I just do it on a regular cycle. Unless somebody blocks me or they say, no, thank you. Then I keep sending. And I think that's one of those things that I realized when I interned for an illustrator, how much you are doing a lot of self-promotion. I would be honest and say half of the job is self-promoting yourself. Also for writers, authors are big hustlers. I was like amazed. I was like, wow, you do all that. I have an author at my agency um, that we're with. She did 67 school visits. There's only 52 weeks out of a year, right? And so that she's just going all over the place to get her work out there. And I think a lot of it's predicated on being willing to put your work out there, send it out. You're only going to get better. The trajectory is if you keep working on something, you just keep going better, better, and better. And then it's like that right moment. And then somebody's willing to take the risk. And so I got lucky that it was an assistant editor that is hungry and being like, okay, I met with her, got a good vibe. She's doing visits already, doesn't even have a book. Oh my goodness, I think this is a winner. So they're kind of, they don't really, like if you ask editors honestly, they'll be like, I, I see it when I, when I read it, I know it. <laughs> and then they're like, they're like, thanks, that wasn't really helpful. But yeah, I would say if you love illustrating for picture books and you don't want to write it, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So you do have as far as with, um, and I did the same basic query for my literary agent, and then also for Holiday House, they're very similar. So it's like, you have your brief little pitch. And so the pitch is very just short, like for picture books, it might be no more than three sentences. And I basically say, this is the title. And then I basically wrote about like, to kind of a teaser, like you think about a movie trailer, you're just kind of teasing them. You don't want to give them the whole ending. Um, I give them a word count. Most picture books nowadays, sadly, they are 500 words or less <laughs> and getting lower. Um, but also what the age range it's for. I also did comparative titles. So when I say a comparative title is what are picture books that are currently being published within the last three years in the marketplace that are similar? They're not the same, but like I kind of realized like, and it was never intentional because I seriously do what you, you love, but it is a business. And so editors and agents want you to be aware of like what's coming out and so they kind of want to know that you've done a little bit of research on it 
And so there's a website called Publishers Marketplace. So you have to pay a subscription fee for it, but you can get a list of like every book they want to deal and out. So these agents who are getting deals, they want to be like, hey, look at me, I got a deal. And so they publish them there. And anybody in the pu children's book publishing industry, um, they look at that and then it gives like basically sample pitches. And you can see this is what a pitch looks like for any kind of book because it's any book deal that's being made. Um, yeah, by the publishers. As far as that, then I put a little bit about myself. I would keep that super short. You know, they if they're getting 800 of these, if it's an agent, I have no idea how many editors are getting, but only things that are pertinent to what would make them interested in you as an author and illustrator um, for your work. So if you have, you know, one, any kind of, if you did a weenie diverse books, um, mentor you know you actually got one of those mentorships i would put that in your cover letter or some kind of recognition that ties into it and then i basically made a book dummy what you would probably learn in your book illustration classes the one thing i did that was different is um i only did two finished samples i know they like a lot more um but i did two finished samples and then the rest of it was value and um just line sketches so enough that they can read it, because if it's not readable at the end of the day, and I also had my text in play, so it was basically a PDF and they could flip through it. So yeah, um, some people, if you decide you're just wanting to write, then you would do, they have templates online and you would, could have a written manuscript. My agent does not require me to have a Word manuscript. She basically wants the book dummy. Um, but it could be different based on who your agent is because they will all work a little differently. Did that help? Oh, sure, no problem. Yeah, if you are really good at writing, because like the, I would say the vast majority as far as picture books, it's usually just authors. I run into way more people who are just writing stuff. If you are really strong at writing, they have, I have to, you can Google it, but there was like one really good one. There's a template for, um, it's like the picture book mentorship. They have a free template and I use that. I say, if it's there, it's free, use it. Um, but it's called picture book mentorship and they have a link for a free manuscript template. And if you're doing a picture book, you if you can follow that template and put your text in there and really make sure like, get critique partners, get people who are beta readers to read over it. Um, I would keep illustrators notes to a minimum. Most editors do not like, you know, cause authors bless their heart. And, you know, I, I feel for them because they really want to be like, oh, I want to see this and I want to see that. I want to see a kid who looks like blah, blah, blah. But then you don't give the illustrator a chance to do their job. I would like leave as much of that out of there and then just put your text in there, get beta readers, critique groups, and then see if you can, because yeah, a lot of these houses, they'll just take the manuscript. Thank you. Yeah, oh, you're welcome. Oh, by the way though, the illustrators do get paid more though than the authors, just a side note. <laughs> and if you're gonna use Oh, that's so sweet.